Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video, we are going back to the three body problem series. We will be doing the second book in that series and it's called The Dark Forest. This book was published in 2008 and it's the second book in a trilogy that is entitled Remembrance of Earth's Past. The trilogy was written by Leo Sijin. Before we go on, consider subscribing if you haven't done so. Give us a like, drop us a comment and now let's get into it. Our story begins in a graveyard in China, at the gravesite of Yang Dong. At Yang Dong's headstone, her mother, Yi Wenjie, and a friend of hers, Luo Ji, is visiting. Luo Ji is an astronomer who's moved into sociology. Yi Wenjie suggested to him that he should begin the study of cosmic sociology. By that she means the study of civilizations that make up the body of a cosmic society. He points out to her that there's nothing concrete to study in cosmic sociology. Surveys and experiments aren't possible. She replies that that's why his work will be theoretical. He'll set up a few simple axioms to derive an overall theoretic system of using those axioms as a foundation. She goes on to say there would be two axioms. First, survival is the primary need of civilization. Second, civilization continuously grows and expands, but the total matter of the universe remains constant. She goes on to say, to derive a basic picture of the cosmic sociology from these two axioms, you need two other important concepts, chains of suspicion and the technological explosion. She goes on to tell him that he could become the Euclid of cosmic sociology. And after telling him that she has fulfilled her duty, she left. And after staying there for a little while longer, he also left. Sometime earlier in the Pacific on the ship the Judgment Day, as it heads for the Panama Canal, Mike Evans was having a conversation with the Trisolarians via the Sofan. He was seeing the text from the Sofans displayed on his retinas. The Trisolarians were confused about some of the things that humans say and were trying to get Mike to explain them. It turns out that the differences between the Trisolarians and humans are significant because to the Trisolarians, to think is to speak. They are telepathic and cannot hide their thoughts from each other. So in their society, there is no cheating or lying or scheming or pretending. But in humans, thinking and speaking are two different things. For a human, it is easy to hide your thoughts and it is easy to lie, cheat, scheme and pretend. At first, the Trisolarians assumed that their way of communication was much better and superior than human. But Mike informed them that the way humans communicate is not a weakness. Mike goes on to tell the Trisolarians that they need us. And the Trisolarians replied, I am afraid of you. And that was the last time that Mike Evans ever received a message from Trisolaris. In the Chinese shipyard, Wu Yue and Zhang Beihai are watching the Tang being constructed. Wu is the ship's captain, while Zhang is the political commissar. As they were both about to head to take a closer look at the Tang, they both got a text message recalling them to their car. They had both just received emergency orders recalling them back to the general staff. In Cheyenne Mountain, in the nuclear missile defense control room at the NORAD command center, target screening officer radar and orbital monitor officer Jones watched as a missile was launched automatically from Fort Greeley, Alaska, headed up into space. The missile was launched because of an error. The system detected the reflected film of the ISS and launched the missile, assuming that it was a SOFAN unfurling in Earth's orbit. General Fitzroy, who is the high-level coordinator with the Planetary Defense Council, was a bit confused as to why no one stopped it. They explained to him that the system reacts faster than humans can, and the data have not been moved from the old system to the new one yet. Both Radar and Jones went outside to take a look and see if they could see the missile exploding, but they saw nothing. Cheyenne Mountain is now part of the planetary defense system to defend against the arriving Trisolarians. Back in China, 
Zhang Yuan Chao, on his first day after retirement, met with his friend Yang Jinwen, who was already retired. Watched on the news as they said that a U.S. national missile defense system successfully completed a test destruction of a reflective film that was discarded from the ISS last October and it shows that they would be able to successfully defend against a lower dimensional unfolding so far in near Earth orbit. They also watched as the news interviewed noted physicist Ding Yi about people attributing the deaths of some scientists to the Sofans killing them. Ding Yi proclaimed that the Sofans can't physically kill anyone. All they can do is disrupt the workings of high physics. The two of them were soon joined by a neighbor, Miao Fuquan, who has an apartment nearby that he lets his mistress live in. He told them as he came in that nobody's getting rich. The trouble is at the mine and he's got to go clean it up. That is practically wartime and the government means it this time and that the mines aren't going to be running for much longer. One night in an unknown basement, a man only known as the second wall breaker was lying on his bed. When he pulled out a gun from under his pillow and put it to his head about to kill himself, he saw a so fond text appear before his eyes. It was the first transmission that anyone had received from the so fond in years. After proving to him that the communications was really from the Trisolarians, they gave him a password that would unlock the final encrypted message that Mike Evans left them. We learned that the UN has a project called the Wall Facer Project that was about to be put into action, and that's why the Trisolarians finally contacted them. And now, because of the differences in mental transparency, that gave the Trisolarians all the more resolve to wipe out humanity. And they promised the second wall breaker that if he helps them wipe out humanity, then they will wipe him out. We also learned that the ETO, the Earth Trisolaris Organization, is on the brink of collapse. And they told him to carry out Evans's last orders. In a very remote part of the internet, the virtual game that was the tree body problem came back to life. One man entered the game. He was King Wen and he yelled and called for anyone else, but nobody answered him. He was on an empty plane with nothing but the stars and the suns above in the sky. He sat there for a while, sped up time in the game, occasionally calling out, but no one ever came. Finally, he sighed and left. In the room facing General Shang Wisi was 30 Army, Navy and Air Force officers. They were the first members of the new Chinese Space Force. Fifteen were Navy, nine was Air Force, and six were Army. General Shang told them that the new Space Force will be more similar to the Navy than any of the other forces. He told them that their duty would be to provide a theoretical framework for space warfare and that it will be a daunting task. When it starts out, the Space Force will be more like a military academy. The primary task of the people here will be to organize that academy and then invite a sizable group of scholars and researchers to join up. He then told them that basic research will take at least 50 years, then another 100 years before practical use of the technology required for large-scale space travel becomes possible. And after its initial construction, the space fleet will require another century and a half to achieve its planned scale, which means it won't reach its full combat capacity for another three centuries. The first generation of officers and crew won't be born until two centuries from now, and two and a half centuries from that, Earth's fleet will meet the alien invaders. And on those first ships will be 15 generations of our grandchildren. Miao Fuquan invited Zhang Yuang Xiao and Yang Jin Wen to his place to have a drink. There they was able to find out that Miao had gone to the bank and withdrawn some funds before the run in the bank commenced and the government shut down the withdrawal of funds. They then watched the news which explained the doctrine of escapism which arose alongside the trisolar crisis. The doctrine of escapism says that given the lacked state of humanity's advanced sciences, it doesn't make any sense to plan for a defense of Earth and the solar system in four and a half centuries. 
considering the extent to which human technology can develop over the next four centuries, a more realistic goal would be to construct starships to enable a small portion of the human race to flee into outer space, thereby avoiding the total extinction of human civilization. Escapism has three possible destinations. Option one, a new world, that is searching among the stars for a world where humanity can survive. Without question, this is the ideal, but it requires extremely high navigation speeds and the voyage will be long. Given the level that human technology can attain during the crisis period, this option is unlikely to be realized. Option two is a starship civilization. Humanity would use their escape ships as a permanent abode and human civilization will endure in an eternal voyage. This option faces the same difficulties as the New World, although it places greater emphasis on the establishment of closed ecosystem technologies. A generation ship running a fully enclosed biosphere is far beyond humanity's current technical capabilities. And option three is temporary refuge. Once the Solaris has completed settlement of the solar system, there can be active exchanges between the Trisolarian society and humans that have fled into outer space. By pushing for a relaxation of policies toward residual humans in outer space, they will eventually be able to return to the solar system and coexist on a smaller scale with the Trisolarians. Although the temporary refuge is considered a more realistic plan, there are still too many variables. Plus the fact that members of the UN Security Council and the Planetary Defense Council have been unwilling to share technology with the rest of the nations of Earth. After listening to the news, Miao Fuquan mentioned to the other two that he has contacts with the Planetary Defense Council and they may be able to buy their way in. The other two get upset at him because they're not rich and he is, so they yell at him and storm off. The Trisolarians contacted the second wall breaker once again, this time informing him that they want the ETO to halt or delay humanity's escape plans. They also told him that they've told their fleet to make some adjustments in its solar system deployment. It will detour to four directions at the Kuiper belt and encircle the solar system to hopefully stop any humans from escaping. The second wolf flower informs them that they don't have to worry about humans escaping because who goes and who stays will be the trap that stops any human from escaping. Zhang Yuan Shao met with one of Miao's contacts in the PDC, Shi Xiaoming, who assured him that while it's not a small amount of money, that it would only take 120 years to build the ships and take off and escape Earth. He also goes on to tell him that by the time the ships are ready to launch, Earth will probably be involved in an internal war anyway because the rich nations are refusing to share their technology with the poor and developing nations and those nations are threatening to pull out of the non-proliferation treaty. And as time goes on, the price of a ticket will soar. And the more money you have, the more you will think of preserving your family line. So he told him to think about it and give him a call when he's ready and he'll help him fill out the paperwork. King Wen went back into the virtual game The Three Body Problem and this time he met Newton in the game. They decided that this virtually defunct game would be the most secure place for the remaining members of the ETO to meet securely. We also find out that the Sofans have been in contact with many of the remaining members of the ETO. They believe that the reason the government has not wiped out the remnants of the ETO is because they're trying to use them to have contact with the Trisolarians and gain any technology that's given to them. Luoji was in a hotel room with his latest girlfriend trying to remember her name. They've been together for a week and he was afraid to ask her what her name was. The last time he did that to someone, it didn't end well. They were talking about how no one is going to escape Earth and they were happy they had no children because bringing a child into the world when it's destined to die would not be good. They finished and went down into the restaurant of the hotel to have something to eat. When they were finished eating, they went out onto the sidewalk, said goodbye, and as she spun around, her bag almost hit him, causing him to fall backwards. That saved his life. 
because just at that moment there was a car accident just in front of him and a third car trying to avoid the first two came up onto the sidewalk just missing him because he had fallen backwards but hit the girl instead flipping her over the top of the car and killing her. Zhang Yuan Chao was with the rest of his family at the hospital waiting room because his daughter-in-law was about to give birth. That was when Yang Jin Wen pulled him out of the waiting room and showed him today's newspaper. The UN had just passed resolution 117 declaring escapism illegal. The resolution called on member states to enact legislation as soon as possible to put a stop to escapism and the Chinese delegation reiterated that they fully support Resolution 117. Yang Jin Wen told him that it's a good law because inequality of survival is the worst sort of inequality and the people and the countries left behind will never just sit and wait for death while others have a way out. There will be extreme confrontations between the two sides until there's world chaos then nobody goes. Zhang Yuan Chao was now worried because he had spent 400,000 yuan to buy an escape for his family. Luo Ji was arrested just after the accident and taken to a room that was 10 levels underground. In a small dusty room, a policeman came in to see him and he said his name was Shi Qiang. Luo Ji began defending himself and as Shi Qiang told him they have some time, that's when there was a knock on the door and a young man entered with a suitcase telling him, Captain Xi, it has been moved ahead, we are leaving now. Meanwhile, Zhang Beihai went to visit his father in his hospital room and there he told him that he had joined the Space Force. Then he asked him one question, so what should I do? His father answered him, all I can say is to think long and hard first. Then after having a long conversation of many things, he finally left. Meanwhile, Liu Ji was given a bulletproof jacket to wear, which made him wonder who would want to kill me. They then took him up and loaded him into an armored car that was surrounded by armed soldiers and drove him to the airport. It was a military airport and they loaded him onto a plane and the plane took off. Wu Yue and Jiang Beihai were once again back looking at the unfinished Tang battleship. They were now members of the Chinese Space Force. Wu Yue was upset because he believed that they were involved in what was going to be a losing battle. But Jiang Beihai had confidence that they could win. He pointed out all the times in history that a technologically inferior force defeated a technologically superior force. But of course, Wu Yue doesn't think that that will happen this time. Somewhere over the Pacific Ocean, Luo Ji doesn't know where he's going and Shi Qiang is not telling him. Instead, Shi Qiang is telling him about interrogative techniques, what works and what doesn't. As Luo Ji goes to lay down and sleep, he looks out the window and he sees four Air Force jets on one side of the plane escorting it and he realizes there's probably another four on the other side. Back in China, at the meeting of China's Space Force, Zhang Beihai reads his report on defeatism and its danger to everything they're trying to do. He goes on to say that defeatism is rampant throughout the force and throughout Earth and he lists all of the different ways that defeatism is showing. He then lists as an example of a person who has a defeated attitude was Wu Yue. Wu Yue admits that Colonel Zhang is accurate about his mental state and that he accepts his conclusion and he admits that he's no longer fit to serve in the Space Force. Then another colonel chastises him for bringing up this issue and not going through proper channels. Then General Shang commends Colonel Zhang for his report but said that this should go through proper channels. All of the others breathe a sigh of relief because they don't know who else name is in his little notebook. On the plane, Luo Ji was remembering when he was in college and he had a girlfriend that was a writer. One day she asked him for a present, a birthday present, that would be a novel and she told him to create a character for the novel. When he didn't do it properly, she taught him how to do it 
and the girl he created took on a life of her own. He did not control her. She had her own personality. Then his girlfriend admitted to him that she had one too that was always with her. He went to several psychiatrists because he was worried, but they told him not to worry about it, that the influence of his imaginary character would fade in time, and it did. Just then, the plane seemed to hit an air packet, and Shikiang came in and told him that there was a mix-up with the escort change, but that everything was okay now, so he should go back to sleep. This is the end of part one. Part 2 of this novel will be in a future video. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like. Drop us a comment. And I will see you in the next video.